ever since the discovery of oil and gas in the North Sea in the mid-1960s, companies have sought to exploit these valuable commodities, pushing the limits of offshore engineering in this hostile environment. But in 1980, a catastrophic event happened that sent shockwaves throughout the developing oil and gas industry, after a devastating accident killed 123 offshore workers. This is the story of the Alexander L. Keeland disaster. The Alexander L. Keeland was a semi-submersible mobile drilling unit. A semi-sub drilling rig moves from location to location to conduct drilling operations. The structure of the semi-sub usually has pontoons which are submerged below the water and columns extend above the surface to support the main structure including the drilling derrick. The whole structure continues to float whilst drilling operations are conducted. Older rigs are moored in position using anchors, although modern rigs tend to have thrusters that use dynamic positioning to stay on station during operations. The Keeland was a relatively unusual semi-sub rig, being a pentagon shape with five columns and a pontoon at the base of each column, in contrast to the more common design which uses two large pontoons supporting multiple columns. It was developed through a collaboration between the Institut Francais du Pétrole and the Schlumberger company Forex Neptune, and was one of 11 rigs built to this design. The rig was named after Alexander Lange Keeland, one of the so-called Four Greats of Norwegian Literature, and was operated by the Stavanger Drilling Company of Norway, a subsidiary company of the A. Gowart Olsen Shipping Company. When Alexander Keeland was built, the parts for the rig were made by various subcontractors, Everything was transported to the CFEM shipyard in Dunkirk, France, where the rig was assembled. It measured 85 metres by 80 metres and had a displacement of around 14,750 tonnes. The Keeland was completed and delivered on June 5, 1976. The rig could also be used as a floating hotel, or floatel for short, to provide additional living quarters for offshore workers on oil platforms. By 1978, additional accommodation blocks had been added to the platform, so that up to 386 persons could be accommodated on the rig. In 1980, the rig was awarded a contract by the American oil company Phillips Petroleum to provide accommodation for the Edda 27C platform. The Edda was one of the platforms used on the huge Ecofisk oil field, located in the Norway sector of the North Sea about 200 miles southwest of Stavanger, in a water depth of around 70 metres. Early in the evening of 27th of March 1980, more than 200 men were off duty in the accommodation on board the rig. Conditions were stormy, with dense fog, winds gusting up to 40 knots, and waves up to 12 metres high. The Keelan disconnected and moved away from the Edda platform on its winches, waiting for the weather to pass. Just before half past six, workers on board heard and felt a sharp crack. One of the rig's five columns separated from the main structure, and the rig quickly listed to 30 degrees. Five of the six anchor chains had broken, and the last remaining one was preventing the rig from capsizing. The radio operator on board the Keeland immediately sent a distress call. Mayday, mayday, Keeland listing. The call was picked up by ships and other installations in the area, and ships started to move to help. But there was no standby vessel on location to provide immediate help. The workers on board the rig were scattered around the installation and used various escape routes to get to the lifeboats. The Keelans had seven David launched lifeboats and a further 20 20 man life rafts. Efforts were made to launch a number of lifeboats but the listing of the rig made launching them difficult. Lifeboat 4 was lowered to the water, but only one of the hooks unlatched. The hooks would not open on load. A safety device did not allow release until the strain was removed from the cables. But because of the angle of launch, only one hook activated. Hanging by the remaining hook, lifeboat 4 smashed against the side of the rig. Other lifeboats were attempted to be launched, Lifeboat 1 was lowered to the water with 26 persons on board, but failed to detach from the hooks. An axe was used to hack off the final hook 
to detach the boat. Lifeboat 3 was lowered to the water, but failed to detach. It was thrown against the underside of the rig and crushed, tipping the occupants into the sea. In total, only one of the lifeboats was able to be launched successfully. Many workers refused to get into the lifeboats, thinking it was unsafe to launch them, but also thinking that the rig wouldn't really sink. Some were washed overboard after being struck by moving debris. An S-61 helicopter arrived on the scene, but could only watch on in horror as it did not have rescue equipment on board. A personnel basket was lowered to the sea by the Edda platform, which managed to rescue seven to eight people from the water. As the rig listed further, many people clambered onto column B, clinging onto the mooring cables. But several were killed when that final mooring cable broke. After 14 tortuous minutes, the rig then capsized rapidly. Most of the rig's personnel were now in the icy cold water. March is the coldest time of the year for sea temperatures in the North Sea, with survival timed of around one hour. So getting rescue boats to the area was now crucial. The first ships arrived on scene at around seven o'clock. By this time, the workers had already been in the water for around 20 minutes. Some survivors were rescued from the water, but the foggy weather made finding survivors difficult. One vessel, the standby vessel Silver Pit, arrived on the scene after one hour. Ironically, this vessel was also heavily involved in the rescue of survivors of the Piper Alpha disaster some years later. They could hear screams and voices in the fog, but despite their best efforts, were unable to locate the workers. Despite the weather, many survivors were still rescued by boats and rescue helicopters that had now arrived on location. Out of the 212 people that were on board, 89 people were successfully rescued and taken to Central Hospital in Rogaland. But tragically, 123 workers had perished. At the time of the accident, this made it the world's deadliest offshore oil and gas disaster and is still the second worst accident with only the Piper Alpha accident in 1988 which killed 167 people, surpassing it in magnitude. The investigations commenced immediately and a Norwegian Commission of Enquiry was established. Attention focused on why the column had failed so catastrophically. The investigation revealed that the root cause of the failure was a seemingly insignificant, non-load-bearing weld on a hydrophone instrument that had been installed in Brace D6. Poor fillet welds on the hydrophone resulted in a crack developing from the instrument that propagated into the brace itself. The crack extended around the brace until it severed completely. The non-redundant nature of the structure could not tolerate a failure of this brace, which led to increased stresses on the column itself, which parted from the rig. From this point onwards, the fate of the rig was sealed. The rig was towed inshore and righted. A search was made inside the accommodation and a number of bodies were removed from inside the rig. But 30 workers were never recovered and remain missing to this day. There was some debate about what to do with the vessel, but it was eventually towed to the Ned Strand Ford in Norway and scuttled. There were some claims after the event that the installation manager knew about the crack and that the rig was due to come off station for refurbishment, but there was never any evidence to justify these claims and unfortunately the rig manager was one of those who died in the accident. The sister vessel for the Alexander Keeland the Henrik Ibsen, was due to replace the Keeland on station when the rig came in for refurbishment. But whilst preparing for mobilisation, the Henrik Ibsen suffered a ballast failure, causing the vessel to list severely. Not surprisingly, the contract for the Henrik Ibsen was cancelled. The Alexander Keeland accident led to major improvements in offshore safety. Immediately after the event, the Norwegian Maritime Directorate demanded that all floating units off Norway 
should be taken to land as soon as possible and checked for cracks. Regulations were introduced which required that such floaters must remain buoyant, even if one of its supports columns came off. By making parts of the deck structure buoyant for example, the design of lifeboat hooks was changed to allow them to be released even when they are under load. Improvements in the command structure on offshore installations were put in place to manage emergencies more effectively. And the directorate also required that all personnel on both fixed and floating units be issued with survival suits. But all this was too late for the crew on the Keeland, and a memorial was erected on the coast in Norway, the broken chain, standing some four meters tall, to commemorate the victims of this disaster. And that concludes the sad tale of the Alexander Keeland. If you found this video interesting, please like and subscribe to my channel, and let me know what you think about this disaster in the comments below. Thank you for watching.